charge on. We commit to do extraordinary things. It's a catalyst for action. To put in the work. To keep trying. It's a challenge to be smarter and stronger. Charge on. It drives us to be more. To get after it every day. It's time to rise above. To let them know we're coming. Charge on. Charge on. Good morning. Welcome to the distinguished the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series for dedicated to Dr. Abraham Pizam. This will be our last series of this kind in honor of um, Dr. Pizam, our founding dean of the Rosen College of Hospitality Management and the Linda Chapman Eminent Scholar Chair in Tourism Management. As we have mentioned several times, uh, Dr. Pizam has reached an important life milestone last year when it was 50 years ago that he defended his PhD. So today we will have a different type of format as compared to the previous one. And I will take this opportunity to thank all those guest speakers who um, we consider as pioneers in our field. Uh, Dr. Jafar Jafari, Dr. Ari Reichel, Dr. Brian King, Dr. Anna Matilla, Dr. Pauline Sheldon, Dr. Chris Ryan, and Dr. Joseph Mazinek. And today, um, all of them have provided us with insightful views about how our field has evolved over the past 50 times, how they were inspired by APE's um, scholarship, and also all the touch points that they had with APE's um, um, scholarly work. But today, it's going to be different. First of all, today is APE's birthday. Happy birthday, and many, many, many more. So um, we are very, very happy to have you with us. And it will be a conversation with him in order to try to get a sense uh, about how he sees 50 years back and 50 years from now. And um, we would like to invite all of you to post your questions in the Q&A section. And uh, I would like also to welcome uh, Dr. Alan Fayad, uh, um, welcome, Alan. Good morning. And uh, Dean, uh, Dr. Um, Yu Chen Wan, welcome uh, to all of you. And of course, welcome, Abe, um, to this very, very special occasion um, dedicated uh, to you so deservedly. So, Alan, I would like to start with you if uh, um, you want to commence with the, the conversation with Abe. Yes, certainly. And very many happy returns, Abe. Thank you. Have a super day. And I, I'm going to ask very nice questions, Abe, because you recruited me. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be nice to you, obviously. You. Abe, actually, this may not be an easy question. Can you take yourself back 50 years and just give us an appreciation of what was tourism and hospitality research like all that time ago? You know, what was it like? How did it work? What were the vibes? Thank you very much, first of all, for all the great honor that you uh, award me. And it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to have people like you as my colleagues. To answer your question, 50 years ago, the field of tourism was in its infancy and the field of hospitality was hardly existing. Uh, in terms of tourism, most of the tourism works that were uh, written on that in that period were from non-tourism scholars, so to speak. They were anthropologists, they were sociologists, some of them were management science, and the majority of the beginning of those were about the macro aspects of tourism, both in terms of economics and social. So there weren't many 
who did any work in this area. And as far as hospitality, the hospitality was considered hotel management, and it was also taught and researched mostly in trade schools. Switzerland at the time was the leading university, if you can call it at the time, which was not even a university, the leading school that taught hotel management. And the field of hospitality started only a few years later when they encompassed in under the umbrella of hospitality, not only hotel management, but restaurant management and event management. So as far as works, and research were mostly in the field of tourism and very little in the field of hospitality management. And Abe, what was your interest to get involved? Because you know you probably could have studied a whole host of different things, but what, what, what was the catalyst to get your interest? My catalyst was a pocketbook written by George Young at who was Sir George Young, absolutely, mm -hmm. who uh, wrote a book called Tourism, Blessing or Blight. Oh, okay. And in it, he mostly criticizes the development of tourism as a huge industry that the cost outweigh the, the benefits. And I got, you know, intrigued by that book. And I started looking into other particular types of research and mostly intrigued also by Eric Cohen, who was one of my instructors in my undergraduate studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So when I put the two together, I was very intrigued by that and I started to take an immediate interest in this particular field of study. Uh, thank you, Abe. Uh, if I can uh, have a follow-up question, uh, maybe you can bring us a little bit back to uh, to, to the uh, to the present, um, a little bit into the future. Uh, even though, of course, you know we cannot predict really long term into the future, because nobody will have the crystal ball in terms of what's going to happen in the next uh, you know thirty years, forty years, or fifty years. You know, governed by the Morse law, everything we do right now is so much uh, accelerated. It is really, really difficult to predict, right? Uh, but, you know, in the last 50 years, you know, uh, for you as one example, um, your degree, your PhD degree was not really focusing on anything related to hostile and tourism. So as far as I know, you know, your PhD was focusing on business administration, right? That's and correct. how did you get into this hostility and tourism uh, I cannot call it discipline because somebody else, somebody else will argue for uh, against that. Uh, but you know, how did you get into this uh, domain, so to speak, right? And then, what we have learned in the past fifty years in terms of you know what is working, what is not working, maybe a little bit you know into the future, next five years and ten years, you know, what do you see? Some of the trends are uh, coming up. So let's start with the first. What intrigued me beyond you know, this book that I read and the conversation I had with Eric Cohen was that I saw tourism also as a field of management studies. My PhD was in business administration. You're right, the management of business enterprises. And my dissertation, as a matter of fact, was on industrial systems, on what it was at the time uh, and National Cash Register and, uh, you know, other companies uh, of that sort, which was nothing to do with tourism. But let's not forget that I was at Cornell and Cornell had <laughs> a very famous hotel school. So whether I liked it or didn't, I interacted constantly with colleagues and faculty members who were teaching also in the hotel school coming from the business school. So I had a personal relationship with both and I was able to absorb a lot of the material that was taught in the hotel school while I was going in business school. And by the way, that's 
where I first met Jafar Jafari, Dr. Jafari, who was a student in the hotel school and I was a student in the business school. So we started interacting and have a long friendships, a lifelong friendship between us and exchange uh, many ideas and many topics between us. As far as what I see the field expanding, first of all, on the tourism side, I think we have learned a lot that there is a limit to what destinations can absorb in terms of tourism. And the limit is not one particular number. The limit varies by the type of community, by the type of tourism. But no matter what, there is a limit. And beyond that limit, the negative aspects of tourism outweigh the positive one. Today, we call it over tourism. In the past, we use different terms, but it's the same thing that we realize that it's not totally open and absolutely unregulated because if that would happen, obviously the communities in which tourism occurs will no longer benefit and will no longer support it. And while I was going to school, I noticed that in the upstate New York, where there is a lot of tourism communities, by the summer times, many local residents will come out with signs and placards, tourists go home, you're not welcome here. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the phenomenon where communities started raising against <clears throat> uh, over tourism, what we call today, because they did not entirely benefit from it or the costs were outweighing the, the benefits. So that is no longer the issue here in today. I think most communities realize that there is a absolute number, whatever that number is, in which tourism can exist with the support of the local residents. Beyond that, it starts going down, the support's going down. And when the support going down, the quality of the tourist experience is reduced and sooner or later, tourists will no longer be there. So we realize today that we in the tourism business depend on the goodwill and support of the local communities and without them, tourism cannot flourish. 50 years from now, I think this would have been solved. People will have realized what these maximum numbers are and no longer uh, you know, try to say the more the better mm -hmm. because this is no longer the case. So I'm pretty comfortable in coming out with this statement because I think that local communities have understood that and the tourism industry understands that. And the tourism industry is interested in getting the support of the local community and they themselves will restrict themselves, not open borders for the more the better. As far as hospitality, I think we have learned the lesson about the hospitality industry. And the hospitality industry, I want to remind everybody, is built, is built on the notion of a hospitality culture, which is almost as old as humanity itself. We see this hospitality as a culture uh, mentioned in both the East and the West. And in the Bible, it appears both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It appears in Indian culture. It appears in the Chinese culture uh, of welcoming the stranger and making the stranger feel at home. So my prediction is that while the hospitality industry captured that and brought it as a commercial activity, in the future, 
this particular mm. culture, which I call it an organizational culture, will flourish not just in the hospitality industry, but in other industry, such as healthcare, such as retail, such as public services, public administration. And there is no escape from that because at present, we all like to brag about the high quality of hospitableness in the hospitality industry. But with the interest in other industries in this particular concept, we will flourish throughout the service industry and throughout the economy as well. Abe, so that is my prediction for the future. Abe, I would like to jump in here. You just spoke about organizational culture. Right before that, you spoke about boundaries to uh, the amount of interaction that a community can absorb. So I'm assuming that to the, that particular culture, I'm trying to understand what it is exactly. That would be boundaries as well in terms of friendliness and smile that you would have uh, um, to the amount of strangers that you will interact with. So what is that culture exactly? Can you really you know, um, characterize yeah. it a little bit more? So uh, that reminds me of uh, a fable that is written in uh, the Jewish Talmud, which is the a written part of the oral law in Judaism. And the fable goes like that. Uh, one of the elders of the first century AD by the name of Hillel was asked by a, a person who wanted to convert the Judaism. And the question that he asked Hillel was, can you tell me the entire Torah, which is the law of Judaism, while standing on one foot? And mm -hmm. Hillel uh, replied, of course. And his words were, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation go and study. And I think that says a lot, not just about the subject matter of what is Judaism or what is Torah, but it says a lot about hospitality. What is the essence of hospitality? So I will restate it in modern times and say, do not treat others how you would, wouldn't like to be treated yourself. And that is basically the essence of the culture of hospitality. Have the ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes and see how would you react to the way that you are being treated. And to have that means that you have to have empathy. You have to be empathic. You have to have the ability to put yourself in other people's shoes and feel what they feel. And once you do that, you would provide a better service, a service that would be fulfilling, not just for the person that you are serving, but also for yourself. So to me, this is still the essence of, of hospitality. And this essence appeared uh, in, in Christianity as the golden rule, which says, do not, do unto, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And this appears again in Matthew and Luke, and of course in Leviticus. So all this, in my opinion, is the essence of hospitality and the rest are just details. Yeah. Being able to put yourself in somebody's shoes, feel like they feel and provide a service that you would have liked to have. Thank you question. very much for, for, for the insights. Right. If I, I can follow up, Tico, go ahead, sorry. Yes, I have a question here from Emily from UMass, which I think has a little bit to do with, with what you just said in terms of the theory, you know, accumulation of knowledge. This is what she said. Happy birthday, Professor Pizam. I have a question. I was really inspired by your keynote speech on the continuum of hospitality sectors based on their service levels. 
Professor Tracy also raised the question whether hospitality as a context or as a or as theory. I'm really keen to believe in the latter. What kind of suggestions do you have for fellow researchers aiming to make effort to develop or enhance theories in hospitality? The first thing is to try and extend the notion of hospitality into other service industries. That is important because if we say that hospitality is a culture, then the culture can be practiced in a variety of industries. It does not have to be, uh, you know, hijacked, I call it, by one single industry and practice only in that industry. And if we prove that this is a universal phenomenon, that being hospitable, whether in public administration, in healthcare, in other industry is also something that can be efficient, effective, and results in customer satisfaction, then we can extend that theory to a number of industry and not necessarily to the hedonic industries. Because what is happening today is hospitality is very much associated with one type of industry. This is the hedonic industry where people come and have fun. So the theory behind it is for them to have fun, you have to support that with great hospitableness. And I want to extend that and say, it's not just about fun, it's about efficacy. It's, it's about you know, the end result, which is a satisfied and delighted customer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Abe, for, for your insights. Uh, you, you mentioned previously about, uh, this is just an extension of uh, this particular topic, because you know, I, I think you know, this is a very, very important, uh, not only for now, but also uh, for the future in terms of defining the trajectory of hospitality education and research. You mentioned about the phenomenon based on your observation that you know, we really move from uh, commercial activity, tourism or hospitality as a commercial act activity more towards a social phenomenon, universal phenomenon, which can affect in a lot of other industry sectors, right? And also we move from a more trade or specific, specific industry sector scale sets focus programs to more the culture of hospitality, right? So just give you one example. Um, when I attended hospitality um, first time in this country, uh, at that time was Purdue University. I think that was uh, more than 20 years ago, right? The program is called RHI, which refers to restaurant, hotel, and institutional management. Institutional management basically focusing on the K-12 catering services, you know, food services, right? So it's a very, very specific, okay? Trade focused, specific industry sector focused. And then later on, of course, you know, they add the T, which is tourism into the title of the department, okay? And if you look at the title right now, it has been changed into the department of or school of hospitality and tourism, okay? Mm. And I'm, I observed that a lot of other programs are adopting hospitality into their name, okay? And the same thing happened with our program at Rosen College, you know? I still remember that, you know, when I first joined the Rosen College, I had that, that discussion and then debate with you about why we are skipping tourism, because I know that, you know, you are a, a tourism, a big tourism researcher mm -hmm. yourself, right? So why we skip the key term tourism in our, you know, program title, we call it the Rosen College of Hospitality Management, not Rosen College of Hospitality Tourism and all the others, right? So, you know, that is really interesting. And of course, you know, uh, what we are trying to do right now is just like what you described, is the whole spectrum of hospitality from hedonic, from traditional to hedonic to utilitarian, what we call the hospitality plus, you know, strategy, right? Uh, we are able to do that by, you know, of course, you know, doing uh, something a little bit different. One is the collaborative strategies, you know, with other units across university, right? The other one is that, you know, the sites, because, you know, we have a big size program, 3,500 students, you know, 70 plus faculty members, right? 
But for a lot of other programs, they are not in the same position. They are not you know, fortunate enough to, to, to be located in, in a big destination like Orlando. They are not very big, okay? And then you know, uh, to add the complexity on top of that, uh, academicians are not really good at working with others. You know, we try to protect our own turf. You know, this is you know, ours, that is yours. You know, that kind of mentality, right? So in order to really move our field, you know, either related to the program or research, in order to adapt the concept of hospitality as a culture or as a spirit, right? Uh, how all the other programs can really move forward with this approach, you know, um, because, you know, they are small, they are located in remote areas, the university is not supporting, you know, whatever they want to do. You know, there are a lot of challenges, obviously, right? So how do you, what is your take on that? Yeah, unfortunately, you're right. And many times we are not in control of our own future. I can answer the question about our title and our name, because if you remember the history, we were part of the business school. And yes. when I was recruited, uh, I was recruited to uh, start a hospitality management department. And I had no say in what it would be called and what it would be the subject matter. I was brought in from UMass where there was a department of hospitality, <laughs> HRTA, <laughs> hospitality and, and, and restaurant and tourism administration. So even a more complex name. And they did not have any particular ability to change that because they were outside the business school and the business school did not let them, you know, have something to do with management. The word management was a taboo. So many, many programs like that were started in another unit and they had no choice as to what they call themselves and what their field of study will be. And only when you grow specifically and when you achieve a certain weight and certain size, then you can take care of your own uh, future and call it whatever I do. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, in some cases, we go backwards. Look what happened to Cornell. Cornell used to be a very, very respectable hotel school. And when the new president of the university took over, one of the first things that she did is took a, a Cornell Hotel School and incorporated it under the business school. And now it's part of the business school rather than build on their past, which was a, a glorious past. They put them into uh, a business school as a, as a small unit in there. So it's not always what we want the hospitality faculty and research and even the deans, it's what our supervisor tell us mm -hmm. to do. Now I'll give you one more example. And that in my opinion is a mistake. Many, many hospitality schools were forced also to add the term leisure. So you will now have tourism, leisure and hospitality in the same entity, which brings this hedonic part even uh, at the lower, at the higher degree in emphasis, which is not necessarily what we want to do. We want to make sure that it's expanded outside of the hedonic field. So the answer to your question to summarize it is we don't always have control of our own future and others decide for us what we should be doing or uh, the entity and its name. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Abe. Can I, can I take a slightly different track? Because you've always had an interest over many, many years in safety and security. Some of your early work in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. How do you think the sort of safety and security literature generically on your own work, how did that prepare us for an understanding of a global pandemic? Brackets if at all. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, the entire industry, um, the entire academic field in that and the industry which followed that 
put the emphasis on the security and not the safety, including myself. Uh, I, I came from a country that, uh, you know, suffered from incidents of security, terrorism, and especially in the tourism industry. I saw also the effect of security in terms of theft, in terms of incidents of murder and assault in the hospitality industry itself. So I veered towards that. And so were the other researchers that wrote numerous papers in this field. None of us anticipated that the issue of safety, which the pandemic is part of, would take over the security issue and be more important and have a greater effect. In retrospect, I should have done that, and I admit it, but I was maybe over concerned with the issues of security that were at the time extremely important than the issue of safety. And I just related to that. Do you think the issue of safety will continue, sort of public health and safety, or do you see this as a temporary blip, albeit a very big blip because of uh, COVID-19? Well, I hope not. In my opinion, uh, the COVID-19 has changed uh, the path of history as far as that subject is concerned. That from now on, we will pay significantly more attention because we have suffered significantly because hopefully we have learned from our own mistakes and be able to better prepare for the future. Because this is, in my opinion, not a one-off case. It probably will happen again. I hope it won't but it'll probably happen again with another variant or another virus altogether. And if we will be as unprepared as we were when last year this happened, again, a disaster will happen, especially in the hospitality and tourism industries. Uh, hey, uh, let me bring up a little bit different kinds of uh, uh, question related to uh, research and especially our role as as researchers, right? Because you know there are different uh, uh, perspectives on that, and the different uh, people actually uh, practice practice differently based on what they believe, right? Some would argue that you know we are the conveyors of of, of knowledge, you know, basically it's the messenger of the knowledge, right? Others would say that well, you know, we not only do that, but also we apply what we study, what we find out and to the specific uh, industry and to find solutions for, for them, right? Others would argue that, you know, well, we are researchers, you know, there should be a division of later labor, so to speak, right? So we are responsible for what we are responsible for is to come up with uh, theory and the concepts, right? And it's up to the industry professionals in our industry, of course, you know, because this is very applied to apply those things, you know, whether they are able to apply or not, it is their responsibility. You know, we have done our portion and then we should not be really getting very, very close to the application uh, aspect because we want to protect our integrity of the so-called scientific research, right? So we are scientific researchers, right? We are not practitioners. So what is your viewpoints on that? My viewpoint of that is very clear. Uh, we are first and foremost a management field. And as such, we have the responsibility of not only study the phenomenon that affects management practices, but also to come up with solutions to this industry. To that extent, we are like the medical field rather than biological field. The biological field, you know, studies phenomena that can and will affect human beings, but medicines goes beyond that. They look at the application of that to humans in terms of solving problems of curing diseases and preventing diseases. Mm -hmm. So my opinion is if we do just basic research and we do not try to apply that, we are basically 
fulfilling only part of our duty because our duty is to prepare the future generation of hospitality and tourism managers. And you cannot do that if you do your own research in your own language, in your own journals, and you don't pass that, as you say, conveyor, you don't pass it to the industry. So we have a double role. Yes, we are producers of research uh, and re as such, and we are also conveyor of research to the industry. So I have been complaining for many years that the way that we write our articles, the way that we write our books, it's restricted to only the academics and the graduate students, that the industry never reads them, that the industry never applies that. And if we continue to do like that in the future, we are fulfilling only part of our mission. I, I would like to chime in here. Um, 50 years, a little bit more than 50 years ago, Friedman kind of defined what management is. Management is profit, nothing else. So, and, and when I read articles in multiple hospitality journals, it seems that the role of, of hospitality scholars has been how to, you know, improve that environment to create more profit but they forget that management is more than just profit. It is about, uh, you know, the homes, uh, the employees, uh, equity, fairness, justice, a number of things that are important to society. So how would you really characterize management as we should study it in the future from your perspective? Profit can be defined in numerous ways. And you're right that the major definition of profit is in dollars and cents. Okay, but that would not apply to a public administration. That would not apply to a nonprofit organization, like uh, you know, take some hospitals who are non nonprofit. Okay, how would you apply that to them? So I talk about efficacy, and efficacy is a term that can be used in many industries, in many sectors of the economy where the benefits outweigh the cost, where there is a good that you produce for society, which is not necessarily measured in uh, dollars and cents. And by defining profit in that terms, you can apply it to any management organization, whether it's a nonprofit, for-profit, public administration, and so forth. And that is my a definition of what it should be all about. So should that be um, incorporated in hospitality curriculum? Absolutely, absolutely. Because if you have, you know, you're working in a field which is a non-commercial and there are hospitality in non-commercial areas. So if you have a field of that, then satisfying the wishes and uh, the needs of your customers, which does not necessarily bring you more profits because you're non-profit, then this is efficacy mm. in my opinion. If yeah. you're curing a disease, which does not necessarily mean that you'll make more money because of the, the cure, but you're doing well for the community, that in my opinion is a form of a profit. Hey, yeah. I, I would like I, to do a follow-up follow um, first to congratulate you with your very ex with a very exciting and insightful interview with the winter edition of the Rosen uh, um, review re uh, research review um, in the last winter, and it struck me one of the things that you said where you identify the scholar as doing research being a teacher, but also having a responsibility towards the community. So that's my follow-up question. And then it seems to me, I read through the lines that you were a little bit critical of that particular last dimension of the role. So more could be done as, uh, and I quote, when it comes to fulfilling our role as citizens in our communities and society, I believe that we can do much better. What do you mean exactly by that? Okay, what, what I mean is that most of our research 
is not what I would call it action research. It stops at the point where we found the phenomena, uh, we confirmed it, we wrote about it, and we said what might be the implication for uh, the industry or the community or whatever, but you don't take the next step, which is take part in the application of what you have found in a community or in uh, a country wide. And most academics would like to stay away from that and say that is my, it's not my role, it's not my responsibility. Let others do that. And I feel that we have a responsibility towards society. We have our responsibility towards a community. And we, if we see something wrong and we come up with a solution, we should be part of the solution. And most of us, including myself for quite a few years, chose not to do that because we say to ourselves, this is not our role. This is somebody else's mm -hmm. role. And, and that is a form of indirect criticism of myself and my own community of researchers that choose not to be involved in what I call action research. Hey, but I think, you know, that aspect, um, you know, also um, impact how we uh, teach our students and engage our students, right? And how we develop our curriculum in a way that, you know, students are really integrated into some of the bigger, you know, social problems and community-based problems, right? And, uh, you know, we try something, you know, else uh, just recently, Alan probably uh, can say a few uh, more words about it, you know, that is our prep program and uh, the Vision 2050 prep program um, so our requirement for internship, as one example, is 1,000 clock, clock hours, right? But we say that, you know, out of those 1,000 clock hours, 250 uh, 50 hours can be open, okay? Uh, that will be open to the students for whatever opportunities they think that, you know, uh, they are interested in. And many of those opportunities are cost-driven, you know? So if the students have a passion about working for nonprofit organizations or being involved in community, you know, uh, 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 related events, helping others, you know, uh, raising money for disadvantaged, you know, uh, kids, right? All those activities are kind of counted towards that requirement, you know? So in a way we are trying to, you know, do some of those things, but, you know, I think uh, based on your assessment, you know, probably we will need to do more, continue to do more of those things that, you know, when the students graduate, they will become a whole person. I fully agree with you. And I think we'll do a much better job with our students than with ourselves. <laughs> and that's my criticism, that we teach our students to do that, but maybe our professors, our mentors did not teach us to do that. And we, when we reach that level of distinguished researchers, uh, we choose to separate ourselves from the application of it uh, yeah. And we do much better job with our students, which I agree that we do a wonderful job. And our students also come out with a feeling of being part of the community. And when they solve an issue that affects the community, they solve an issue that affects them directly. So mm -hmm. with our students who are doing a very good job, I agree with you. Abe, I have a question here from Elizabeth Weida from Brazil. It reads as follows. Greetings from Brazil, Professor Pizam. Thank you so much for all the contribution in the hospitality discussions. Your paper written with Professor Azli Tassi, uh, uh, experience, ex experience scape, expanding the concept of service scape with a multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary approach is extensively studied in our graduate program in hospitality. Which are the stakeholders that are forgotten in studies projects that neglect the hospitality culture? Brazilians and other social groups are considered hospitable as individuals, but are not able to transfer this characteristic as professionals, which is the lacking bridge. Thank you. <laughs> it's an excellent question. So I want to make sure that uh, it is clear. When I preach 
the subject, then I consider myself now a preacher. When I preach the subject of a culture of hospitality, I don't restrict it to the relationship between the servers, the serving providers and the customers. I'm talking about the entire organization, all its stakeholders. It's a culture of hospitality that has to be practiced first and foremost among the employees, the managers, the owners, the community, and the customers. Only then we can say we truly have a culture of hospitality in our organization. If we restrict it to the customers, then obviously whenever we go out of that domain, we're going back into the old ways of treating each other uh, the way we shouldn't treat each other. So my idea of a culture, organizational culture of hospitality, having a true service scape is throughout the organization, not just between customer and service provider. Thank you, Abe. I have to, oh, yeah, go sorry, ahead, uh, Alan. Yeah, Abe, I just want to ask a different question. And the hi to Elizabeth uh, in Brazil, that's what stimulated my question. Abe, you've, you've influenced many, many people over the years, without doubt. Who's influenced you? Well, it, different periods in my life. Originally, the, the field that I got into it is the macro aspects of tourism. And one of the person that influenced me the most was Eric Cohen. Eric Cohen is now retired, of course, Professor Emeritus at the Hebrew University. I did my undergraduate degree uh, in sociology and political science. In uh, Hebrew University, you have to have two majors. So I did it in those two. And Eric Cohen was one of my instructors. I got to know him as, as an instructor in the intro to sociology. But later on, when I started moving into the field of tourism, I read some of his papers and I discussed that with him personally. So he was a major influence in my life because I, through him, I got access to all the literature of the cost and benefits of tourism. So that was one of the first person who influenced me. Later on, when uh, I attended Cornell, there were a number of people mostly in the management and management science that influenced me. And, and one of those uh, who I can credit with uh, a lot of the things that I learned from was uh, Jerry, Gerald Gordon uh, from Cornell, the School of Industrial Relations. Cornell had at the time a very interesting uh, type of organizational structure. They had what I would call three schools of business. There was the proper business school, there was the school of uh, industrial relations, and there was, of course, the hotel school. And each of them were separately. And I took courses from all three of them. I was based in the business school, but I took quite a few of my courses in the industrial labor relations, as well as the hotel school. So that person, Gerald Gordon, who invented uh, an instrument called social differentiation uh, was a major influence in my life and academic life, I mean. And I learned from him a lot about research, research methodology, and as well as theoretical aspect. So those two people influenced my career at the early stage. Later on, you know, there is an old saying again in, in, uh, in Hebrew that I learn uh, much from my teachers, uh, most from my mentors and a lot from my students. So I learn from students as well. I learn every day, right. even yeah. today. Hey, Thanks, um, I, I think, you know, yeah, we're, we're coming towards the end of this, of this conversation. Um, but, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, I have the opportunity to say this and maybe have a, a follow-up question. Uh, you know, you are really an uh, inspiration to all of us, you know, and uh, for three of us sitting here, you hired <laughs> all of us, right? 
and really you inspired all of us. You are really a great mentor. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your, you know, uh, mentorship and uh, friendship for these many years uh, since I came to, to know you. Um, my next question actually is a little bit more future oriented. That is the status of our area of study, whether it's a program related or research related, right? Uh, you reviewed uh, some of the things you know happened in the last uh, 50 years and you talked a little bit about, about the future. But the future is really related to the quality of work we do and the significance of the work we do, right, to the society at large. And we believe that, you know, if we do the right thing and then we will get the respect. But that was not the case all, all the way. You know, we came a long way. We came a hard way, right? I heard you, uh, you know, uh, referencing uh, a, guy, a guy called um, Rodney Dangerfield, okay? It's a TV host, you know, every night he would come out and then he had a very, very famous line uh, that says that, you know, hi, my name is Rodney Dagenfield. Uh, I got no respect, okay? So I think, you know, as, as an area of study, probably that it was how we, we got started, right? You know, we got no respect by, by, by nobody, right? So that's, you know, some of the reasons why we as a program were moved, you know, between College of Business and the public administrations and back and forth and back and forth, you know, nobody thought that, you know, we were a good fit, you know, we are doing something of high quality and meaningful to the society, right? But my concern is really in the future, do you think that you have done enough or maybe not enough to earn some kind of respect in the eyes of other people involved with other disciplines? The answer to that is both yes and no. We've done a lot and we've come a long way and we earn the respect of many of our colleagues. But we have to be on guard, constantly on guard because things at a higher level are not just done on the basis of the academic uh, qualification of those units. They are political and there are all kinds of, of politics that happen beyond our control. So we have to have always the you know, responsibility of protecting ourselves from any of such action. And I want to be clear that we are lucky to be in a community which is based on tourism yeah. and hospitality. You know, take us out of this community and put us somewhere in the Midwest when there are no tourists and tomorrow we lose our autonomy, we lose our independence. <laughs> so as long as we have strong support from the industry and the community at large, and we continue to do good things academically, we're safe but we should always be on guard. Hey, uh, I have here uh, a question from Fevzi Alchemist, Dr. Alchemist, and it's, it's related to your um, action research, which I surmise was, you know, a, a way of the future in order to be uh, more, um, to practice a more active role in community. So this is what he is uh, saying. I want to thank Abe for all his service and contribution in order to do more action research and work closely with the industry, do you think we need to change our annual evaluation guidelines and PNT guidelines? Uh, to a certain extent, yes, because I feel that we are mostly communicating among ourselves and we're impressing each other uh, rather than doing this as well as impressing the industry of being a mentor to the industry being a guiding light to the industry. And that unfortunately uh, does not carry as much uh, weight as all the other activities that we do among ourselves. Look at who's reading our journals and our top tier journals. 99.99% .99 of those are other academics. The industry never reads that. The industry never gets the benefit of our own work, what we can do for them and what we should do for them. And that's unfortunate. And it's not just happening 
here in our college, it unfortunately happens throughout other universities where it's more important to create a status among the universities themselves, academics themselves, rather than the society, community, or the industry, whatever that role is. I have and another. If I can, um, Tico, can I ask uh, one more one more question? It's related to to us, you know, uh, you know, because we have to be. <laughs> I have to be a little bit selfish. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Rosen College. Uh, we became a college, independent college, in two thousand four, right? So two thousand four, twenty twenty one. Uh, 16 years, 17 years, and then uh, we are a uh, teenager right now. And I hope that we are not a troublemaker <laughs> as a typical teenager, right? So we are moving into this uh, concept of, 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 of adulthood, right? So where do you see Rosen College is, is heading? Or what, what, what are the specific expectations you might have for our future as, as a college? Well, for many, many years, we have borrowed from other fields of study and we have applied theories and we have applied constructs and research findings from other fields into us, whether it's management, economics, sociology, psychology, and so forth. Now we are moving into the second era of uh, hospitality and tourism, where we are exporting what we found in our industry to others. And that is creating a sense of responsibility. We are seeing other industries coming to us, which we never saw before. Yeah. We're seeing healthcare organization coming to us and asking us to teach them how to better do their own jobs. We are seeing public administration organization coming to us for help. And that is a measure of respect. That is a measure of status that we have achieved that we did not have before. And I think we should continue to encourage those industries and those sectors of, of the economy to work with us. And by doing that, build our reputation and build our status as not just one that is related to a single industry, a single group of organizations. Alan, I would like to defer to you with one last comment before I start concluding uh, this session. Yeah, Abe, it's actually a question from Asley who wishes you a happy birthday. And I think it's an intriguing question. It's a good one to finish, I think. If you had your time again, would you choose hospitality and tourism as your study <laughs> area and why? Absolutely. <laughs> for many That's the reasons. right answer. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and for numerous reasons, hmm. uh, among them that it is exciting field of study that emerged at the time. Today, it's a teenager or maybe a young adults, but it is very exciting to be among an emerging field of study rather than you know, doing the same thing that others have done, you know, in order to continue a stream of research in business administration, in economics, in sociology, or whatever other field of study. So I wouldn't change anything about my field of study in my career. I'm till this very age excited about every day, everything that I do, you all know that I could have retired a long time ago <laughs> and I did not choose to do that. And there is only one major reason because I live what I do and that's part of my life and my enjoyment. Without it, if I had to retire tomorrow for some health reasons, I will shrivel and die. There is no question about it. That's what keeps me uh, relatively young in my mind at least. Okay, and interested in every single day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we are getting close to the conclusion of this session. And before um, we say goodbye today, I would like again to thank those guest speakers that we had before um, in the past seven sessions dedicated um, to APE, uh, Jafar Jafari, 
Ar Ari Reichel, Brian King, Anna Matilla, Pauline Sheldon, Chris Ryan, and Joseph Mazinek. All of you, thank you very, very much for, for sharing with us not only your time, but also your experience and insightful um, views and perspectives about what happened in the past 50 years and where we're heading in the future. Uh, Abe, to you, thank you very, very much, not only for being our colleague and spending all these uh, um, eight to nine months together during these sessions, but also for your 50 years as a scholar by inspiring us, by um, directing and guiding us in, in a very exciting journey in terms of our role as scholars and, and, and citizens. So this has uh, been quite an, uh, a very enjoyable experience to all of us to honor you, to dedicate um, this time to you and to look at your life 50 years ago, to study your touch points in terms of scholarly work and administrator, and also try to tickle your brain about the future, how um, what is um, expected from us, and also what we can expect as, as citizens and, and tourists, administrators, and also residents. Thank you very, very much. And this is all for this time. And I um, would like to defer to A for the last word before we conclude. And I want to thank you all for bestowing upon me this great honor. Uh, I'm humbled and excited about it. And I was delighted to have all these great friends uh, and colleagues of mine speak at this occasion. And I thank them all for their friendship and their support throughout the years. After all, we are a relatively small community of scholars and researchers in this field and we need each other and we need the support of each other. And I want to thank uh, Dean Wang and Alan Fayal and Robert E. Kuros and everybody else who was involved in this particular series for uh, everything that you have done. It was a perfect uh, venture and you showed again that we practice what we teach. So from an event, a point of view, it was a perfect event with perfect execution. Thank you all and may God bless you and give you long life and fulfilling ones. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as a last uh, word, so please, if you have um, any ideas or any subjects that you would like to, to, to for us to discuss in the future, please send those topics to us and we will gladly consider them and um, do some follow-up on these uh, um, topics. This is all for, for us today and for this series. Thank you so much. Please stay safe and God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.